Hello everybody and welcome back to Cozy Faith with Kay. My name is Kaylin and in today's video we are going to be continuing through with our Bible journaling series through the book of John. Now this is meant to be a Bible journal with me. We have went through, you know, John 1 all the way up until a little bit past John 4. In the last video we studied Jesus and the Samaritan woman in detail and normally I just go, you know, one video, one chapter but that one was exceptional and we had a lot of fun in the last video fleshing that out really well and so today I'm back again to finish chapter four with you guys so grab a pen a couple highlighters anything that will help you to get more into the word and we will start this out together but first let's pray dear father God thank you so much for this day God thank you for the person that is watching this video right now Thank you that they have come and that they're ready to Bible study. I pray that you would help me to teach this word effectively and I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us, helping us to understand your word and apply it to our lives. We love you and we give you all of the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everybody. So let's start out at verse 27 in chapter just then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman yet no one said what do you want or why are you talking with her then the woman left her water jar went into town and told the people come see a man who told me everything I ever did could this be the Messiah they left the town and made their way to him and so what this is, is basically, this is a continuation of what happened in this last paragraph here. Um, the Samaritan woman is talking to Jesus and, you know, all of the disciples were amazed at the fact that the Samaritan woman is talking to a Jew, um, more that, that a Jew would be talking to a Samaritan. And so this is surprising to the disciples. Then it says, she left her water jar, went into town, and told everybody, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. And I love that, you know, this should be our first reaction every single time, you know, come see, come see what Jesus did in my life. You know, I was like this before, now I'm like this, come see. You know, our testimony is so powerful and I think that this woman, you know, was doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing when she said, come and see. And so when it comes to Bible study, I just usually grab, you know, whatever highlighters I'm feeling that day, whatever colors I think are cool. Um, I don't really worry too much about color coding or anything like that. I think with the amount of Bible journaling I do, I would probably drive myself crazy trying to remember, you know, the meaning behind each color and you know if I didn't have my certain color highlighter I wouldn't want that to make me not want to study the Bible so anyway I'm just gonna pick a color and start to highlight some of the things that stick out to me so his disciples arrived they were amazed and the woman left and said come and see All right, so right here I just said that they are surprised since she was a Samaritan woman and that the first thing she wants to do is testify. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored and you have benefited from their labor. And so I know what I just said about the highlighting and all that jazz, um, but when a theme kind of starts to repeat from right above it, I often will use the same color that I use just so if I'm going back, I can see exactly where, for example, Jesus' words were. See, in here, Jesus was talking about the water that will never make anybody thirsty again. And of course, he was talking about him as the living water. And now he's talking in the same kind of way, but he's talking about food. So I'm gonna grab the same color that I used last time and we're just gonna start to highlight the words that Jesus said and we're gonna start just flushing out what they mean. 
And so to flesh this out a little bit further, I just want to bring a commentary in here. So here I just have opened the Enduring Word commentary um, for chapter four. I will link this below. Um, I don't always use this commentary, but I find that it's really helpful when you want to get things kind of quickly and really be able to understand and apply them to your life. So, and I really only do this after I've read. I think it's very important to say that when you're reading the Bible, don't just read a verse and immediately go to the commentary. Really try to like flesh it out and try to think about it on your own. And then, you know, if you need extra help, it's always okay to come to a commentary. Um, but you know, the Holy Spirit and his guidance should always be first. And you know, these kinds of things should be supplementary to that. I have food to eat of which you don't know. Jesus wasn't saying that food and drink and rest weren't important. Instead, he wanted his disciples to know that life was more than those things that man does not eat by bread alone. The pronouns are emphatic. I am refreshed by nourishment hidden from you. I have food to eat of which you do not know. In these words, our Lord revealed the secret of his strength and that of the weakness of his disciples. Ooh, I like that. Jesus had a greater source of strength and satisfaction than the food he ate. Jesus explained to his disciples that his true satisfaction was to do the will of his God and the Father. He did not have his focus primarily on the work, the need, the strategy, the techniques, or even the needy soul. First and foremost, his focus was on doing the will of him who sent me. There is nothing more satisfying than doing the work of God, whatever is for the particular believer. Though this is counterintuitive and against our natural self-seeking, it is true. The man of the world thinks that if he could have his own way, he would be perfectly happy, and his dream of happiness in this state or in the next is comp is comprised in this, that his own wishes will be gratified, his own longings fulfilled, his own desires granted to him. This is all a mistake. A man will never be happy in this way. Jesus found great satisfaction in doing the will of God, even when he was weary. In fact, the conscious doing of God's will refreshed the weary Jesus. The bodily thirst, which our Lord had felt before, had been and was forgotten in the carrying on of his divine work in the soul of the Samaritan woman. And so here I said, Jesus is explaining the true food that satisfies him. It is doing the will of God that will truly nourish and satisfy us. And now I'd be lying if I said that next part, um, you know, about the harvest and all of that didn't confuse me a little bit. At first thought, you know, what I'm thinking is he's saying similar to, you know, the time has come and is now near, you know, he's explaining that that the harvest is about to happen. So anyway, I just, I'm gonna look a little bit further and see what it really means. There are still four months and then comes the harvest. This was a proverb with the idea that there is no particular hurry for a task because things simply take time and you can't avoid the waiting. Jesus did not want his disciples to have this mentality. He wanted them to think and act as if the harvest was ready now. The harvest is ready, the wages are there, let no man hang back, a harvest will not wait. Jesus used the idea of food and harvest to communicate spiritual ideas. The idea of harvest meant that there were many people ready to be received into the kingdom of God and that the disciples should see themselves as workers and reapers in the harvest. As he was speaking, the Samaritans were leaving the town and coming across the fields towards him. The eagerness of the people that Jews regarded as alien and rejected showed that they were like the grain ready for harvesting. Jesus warned his disciples not to think there are still four months and then comes the harvest. If they had the eyes to see it, the harvest was ready now, even white for harvest, implying that the grain was fully ripe or even overripe. So this is really cool. Um, what he's saying here is... You know, okay, so in terms of what we're picturing, we had just seen Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan woman immediately goes and she's like, I have to go tell everybody I know because this Jew, I understand previously Jews didn't like us and, and, and weren't very nice, but this one was amazing to me. This one is actually the Messiah. I have to tell everybody about it. And Jesus knows that there's gonna be a lot of Samaritan people about to be coming and it's the disciples' job to then go and reap that harvest. He's saying, you know, ignore that saying about the harvest not being ready, that there's no real hurry when it comes to the harvest. I'm telling you, the harvest is here. And I think he means in terms of these people, the Samaritans that were about to be coming towards them, but I think that this also just means for us today, the world around us. 
you know, there is a harvest there. There are seeds that are being planted that are growing spiritually in people all around us. And as Christians, I think it's it's our job to cultivate those seeds, to plant them if they haven't already been planted, and when ready, yes, to actually harvest them, to disciple people, to walk with them in Christ. And so here I just said, he's saying, you've heard the saying that there is time to wait before a harvest. I am saying to you that the time is now. It's time to harvest and reap what you did not sow. See, these disciples, you know, they probably thought, okay, this woman is going to go and tell about Jesus and that's going to start the relationship. But he's saying, no, 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 no. It's time to harvest it. And you didn't sow this seed into them, but you get to harvest it anyway. Now, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. Love that. See, so powerful to testify. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he said, and they told the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this is really the Savior of the world. Oh, wow, that's really beautiful. See, I really like this because, you know, it starts with the Samaritan going and telling all of her villagers, all the, all the friends, basically, come and see this man. He has to be the savior. He has to be the Messiah because he told me everything I ever did. That was a work, okay? Like that was basically, you know, she would have viewed it as like a miracle or some sort of power. Um, it's easy to to profess that he is a messiah, that he is a savior after physically seeing something like that and hearing him say something so personal to you that there's no other way he could have known. And it's also easy for those people to go and believe that this happened and then because of that say, you know, we believed in him because of what she said. But then just notice Jesus stays with them. And once Jesus stays with them, they believe not just because of what the woman said, but because they've heard themselves and know themselves that he is really the savior of the world. And I think this is what Jesus wants. I don't think it's supposed to be, you know, a passed down belief. I think he wants us to come to our own understanding and belief of him. And even if that means he had to stay with them and take time off of his ministry, off of his plans, so be it. Because I think he values relationship more than just followers. So here I said, at first they believed because of what the woman said. Then he spent time with them and they saw for themselves that he really is savior. Jesus doesn't want followers based on works or stories, but wants a true relationship with us. Sorry guys, hopefully that's a little bit better for you to see. Um, it's really cool in this part because the Samaritans aren't just saying, now we believe he's savior, but that now we believe he is savior of the world. Not just savior of the Jews, not just savior of the Samaritans, but savior of the world. And this was really big. Like I said, you know, the relationship between Jews and Samaritans, there's no way that a Jew would ever stay with a Samaritan for, for two days. But here Jesus is doing just that, breaking cultural norms and treating these people like they're his people which is something that was completely unheard of. After two days, he left there for Galilee. Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When they entered Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him because they had seen everything he did in Jerusalem during the festival, for they had also gone to the festival. The prophet has no honor in his own country. Galilee was Jesus' country where he grew up. Because these people felt so familiar with Jesus, they did not honor him the way they should have. In this, we recognize that they really were not familiar with Jesus. If they were, they would have honored him all the more. He betakes himself to Galilee, therefore, to avoid fame, testifying that his own country was that where, as a prophet, he was least likely to be honored having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. It was customary for the Jews in Galilee to go to Jerusalem for the feast. This particular time, they remembered all that Jesus had done in Jerusalem. Perhaps they remembered when Jesus turned the merchants' tables in the outer courts. Jesus also predicted his own resurrection and performed many other unspecified signs when in Jerusalem.
The enthusiasm of the Galileans was not soundly based. It was dependent on the wonders arising from their sight of the signs, not on a realization that Jesus was indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Their very acceptance of him was thus in its way a rejection. They gave him honor of a sort, but it was not the honor that was due to him. And so here I just said, they knew him in his homeland, but not the way he wanted to be known, just more for the wonders they saw during the feast. And now I'm just going to highlight to connect those two ideas. The second sign, healing an official's son. He went again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a certain royal official whose son was ill at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son, since he was about to die. Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. Go, Jesus told him, your son will live. The man believed what Jesus said to him and departed. While he was still going down, his servants met him, saying that his boy was alive. He asked them at what time he got better. Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him, they answered. The father realized this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, your son will live. So he himself believed, along with his whole household. Now this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. And so here to start, all I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight what the official said and the situation and then what Jesus says. So when we read this here, you know, reading between the lines, we can see that Jesus is a little bit frustrated at people, quote unquote, only believing unless they see signs and wonders, which you would think would be him kind of discouraging this official from asking Jesus for a miracle, which in fact isn't the case. I think it's more of testing his faith. It's understanding that faith needs to come first and that needs to be the big reason that you're you're trusting in God to even ask for a miracle, not the other way around. He, like I said before, doesn't just want a works-based relationship. Um, he wants true faith. And here, you know, there's no big spectacle. Um, you know, one, the official doesn't say, he's of royal blood, you have to do it. You know, he just appeals based on, please come, I know you can heal him, my boy's going to die. And then likewise, Jesus has no amount of drama or spectacle e either. I mean, it's even less than when he turned water into wine. There, you know, he asked for their participation. He said, go get the jugs, fill them up. It was a whole thing. And, you know, there was no flash of light or anything crazy, but it was a show of a miracle. But here he says, go, your son will live. There was no big flash. He didn't go with him and lay hands on him. There was nothing really specific to show that he in fact had healed him. But the man believed what Jesus said and left. And then he goes and he sees that at exactly the time that Jesus said that your son is going to live, that is exactly when he was healed. Something as well to note is that when Jesus does these things, or even when the Holy Spirit does things, you know, I think about how in Acts, when the prison guard was was radically saved from the earthquake and the chains breaking and all of that, um, how himself and his whole household then believed. Um, this is the same thing that happens here. You know, when there's these huge testimonies, know that when you tell somebody what happens, it's not just to bring glory to God, it's also to bring more people to him. You know, that's exactly what happened with the Samaritan woman. She said, look, come see what this man did. He, he told me everything I ever did. He never even knew me. And then a bunch of Samaritans then had interest. He spent time with them and then they believed. And here, it's the same kind of situation. You know, he sees this miracle for himself and everyone in the household then goes and believes. And so here I just wrote, at first it looks like Jesus is trying to discourage the man from asking for a miracle, but it is really just a test of faith. So he does the miracle, but with no show at all. 
The man then shows true belief because he goes. You know, he doesn't ask any questions, he just goes to see. And then I said that it's not just the man, but his whole household that then believed. And so now all I'm gonna do is actually just take some time and connect all of chapter four um, to the notes. This is something that I like to do so that when I'm looking back, it's a little easier to figure out which note is for what. Yes, I draw these arrows, but I find um, a little bit of a tip is to just connect them either with boxes or with highlights. Um, because at a glance, like, you know, I haven't read this in two weeks, but I know that that note, this is green, goes with that, right? Whereas I read this last week with you guys and I'm not sure what this note goes to. So that's what I'm gonna do right now, just super quickly, and you can enjoy the B-roll of me doing that. All right, everybody, so that was the study through the rest of chapter four. I really, really hope you enjoyed it, and now let's pray. Lord, thank you for this study, and thank you for the words that you have spoken in John chapter four. Lord, it was so nice to learn more about your character and learn more about, you know, just how much you cared for people, that you would stay with them, and you're the God that is still doing that. You're still the God that takes the time and wants relationship with us, wants us to have true faith and not just be believing in you for just signs and wonders alone. God, I pray that you would examine our hearts and find anything that is distasteful about them and just purify our hearts for you, Lord. And I pray that these words would just sink into us and help us to understand more about you and would help us in our day and our weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, everybody. Well, that was a study through John chapter four. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please go ahead and leave a comment below letting me know what was your favorite part. This is something I love asking in all of my videos because I love talking to you guys. I love hearing what you enjoyed about the study, what God spoke to you about in the study. For me, I think my favorite part was just, you know, he went and he stayed with them and then their belief changed and he went and he healed and then the man believed and then everybody's belief was there and everybody's belief changed and it's just really cool how one moment can lead to multiple people's salvation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to join the Cozy Crew. We are at almost 8,000 of you beautiful people and I cannot wait to see what God does in the coming weeks and months for this channel. If you haven't already, please go ahead as well and follow my Instagram, I'll pop it up here. If you enjoy kind of more um, exhortational rant like videos all about God and you know prayer and things like that, I think you'd really really enjoy it over there. Um, so my handle is at Cozy Faith with K and I'd love to see you there. And I also wanted to let you guys know that pre-order for my sweaters, the Consider the Wildflowers sweater, is now up. I am not advertising this anywhere other than YouTube because you guys are my OGs. You guys are the ones that you know started it all for me and and I just I really wanted to give you guys the opportunity first there's a coupon code as well um, down below and the whole point of the sweater is you know spreading the message of God that you know you are provided for you are loved and you are cared for and so I hope that it speaks to somebody and without further ado guys I will see you in the next video <laughs> bye